So let's now turn to discussing the concept of gravity and circular motion. So we're going to start this by describing something called uniform circular motion. And all this is is a fancy way of saying you have to be moving in a circle at some kind of constant speed. Okay, And there are some quantities that we can use to kind of quantify this, to study this. Uh, the first thing we're going to want is a change in an angle, change in theta. And you can kind of think of this as being an analog, being analogous to change in position uh, when we're talking about linear quantities, change in theta. So change in theta has a definition, change in theta is equal to a change in s over r, where s has a very specific definition, s is something called an arc length, and r is going to be a radius. So this theta specifically relates to moving in a circle, so we should probably draw a circle so we can understand what it actually is. So there's our circle, and every circle that we know has some kind of radius that's half of the diameter, kind of describes a, about how big the circle is. So your radius is from the middle out to one edge of your circle. And then if I'm rotating around in this circle, if I go rotating through some angle, we'll say maybe I rotate through this angle, we'll call that theta, so that's going to be my angle. That's basically my angular change in position, my change in position. And then if I'm going along the outside part of this circle, so along kind of the circumference, then we get this, along the just along this arc. So going along the arc of that circle, that's what s is, that's the arc length. And our change in theta, we can see, is equal to that arc length divided by the radius. Okay, And we have units that we can use to measure these angular positions. The units that we're typically going to use for measuring angles, we're either going to use radians, or we're going to use degrees. And then occasionally, we might use something called revolutions. These are all kind of the same thing. They all represent the same thing, just different units that we could use to represent this. Radians, if we want to convert between radians, degrees, and revolutions, we know that 2 pi radians is one trip around a circle. That's also equal to 360 degrees which is also equal to one revolution. So we know how far we go around in a circle. Now we need to know how fast you go around in a circle. And we can quantify this with something called the angular velocity, which we use the Greek letter omega. Looks kind of like a curly W. And that's going to be equal to change in theta divided by change in time. And again, we can draw an analogy to velocity in linear quantities. And when we're moving in lines, velocity is just change in position divided by change in time. So it's a very similar kind of idea. The units of omega are going to be equal to the units of angle, which are typically we're going to use radians divided by the units of time, which is going to be seconds. So that's how we use and quantify angular velocity. And we can relate this angular velocity to this linear velocity that we've already studied, that we already know about. So the angular speed, the angular velocity, is related to the linear velocity by the relationship linear velocity is equal to omega, the angular velocity, times the radius, the radius of whatever kind of arc or circular path you're moving in. So that's how we can kind of study how fast you're going around in a circle, using the angular velocity. So if we have a change in position that's equal to basically change in theta for an angle, and we have a change in speed, a change in velocity, that's going to be equal to a uh, change in omega. We also need some kind of value for an acceleration in a circle. Uh, typically, we're going to use the Greek letter uh, alpha to represent angular acceleration. And we give this a special word, uh, this angular acceleration, we call centripetal. A 
another way that we can write centripetal acceleration, we can also just use A with the subscript C. That stands for acceleration in terms of a circle. And that's going to be equal to V squared divided by R. So this is in terms of the linear quantity. So that's the linear velocity V, the velocity if you're going in a line. We can also do this in terms of angular quantities. Uh, by doing a little substitution, we can see AC is equal to omega squared times R. We're going to get units for angular acceleration. Uh, units of angular acceleration are going to be equal to meters over seconds squared. And that's going to have a position. It's going to have a position, uh, magnitude and a direction. So angular acceleration is a vector. So if I'm moving around in a circle, there's my circular path and I have a velocity. My velocity at any point is tangent to that circle. So that's a line that kind of touches the circle at one point and kind of goes off uh, in this kind of direction that we're drawing. So this is the angular velocity. Uh, in relation to the angular velocity, the angular acceleration always acts towards the center of your circle. So that's going to be the direction of your AC when your velocity is going kind of, kind of down tangent to this circle. We can draw a velocity at any point on this circle. We can draw, pick a different tangent point. So if I pick this tangent point over on the kind of kind of edge of this circle, kind of towards the bottom, we're going off tangent, kind of off at an angle is our velocity as we're going around in this circle. And our centripetal acceleration in this case is still going to be towards the center of the circle. So you can kind of think of it like spokes on a bicycle wheel always going towards the center of your circle. So that's going to be your centripetal acceleration. So you might have gathered that all we're doing is walking through everything we've studied already in physics that works in lines and figuring out how they work, uh, how these kinds of things work in, in kind of angles. So if we have some kind of acceleration, some centripetal acceleration, that implies that we're also going to have a force according to Newton's second law, which if we remember is F equals m times a. So if we're moving in a circle, all we need to do is basically re replace the a with a centripetal acceleration. So force acting in a circle is equal to uh, mass, whatever mass is moving in that circle, times the centripetal acceleration. So we can go ahead and substitute in our equation for centripetal acceleration to get centripetal force is equal to mass times v squared divided by r. Or again, all I did was substitute my v squared over r for the centripetal acceleration for going in a circle. Now something to make note of is that the centripetal acceleration, fc, is not some kind of weird special force. It's nothing special. All the forces that we've already studied, they can be centripetal in nature. All this centripetal means, all this little c means, is that your force is acting towards the center of a circle. So we've studied gravity, we've studied tension. All of these forces can be centripetal in nature. So let's say I have a car that's driving over this hill. And this hill is, for some reason, a perfect circle. So my car is at the top of the hill. It's traveling over it. Uh, my car is very blocky, uh, kind of horribly shaped. I have some gravity acting on that car. Gravity is pulling this car, keeping it down, keeping it on the hill so it doesn't fly off into space. So we can see that gravity is kind of acting towards the center of the circular arc that makes up this hill. Since gravity is acting towards the center of a circle, gravity itself is a centripetal force. It's centripetal in nature. And if we want the prototype for a circular force, the prototype, the fundamental circular force, is really going to be some kind of orbit. And to understand orbits, we need to get in tune with something called gravity. So we've studied the force of gravity, how gravity works. Gravity is this force that seems to exist uh, out there everywhere that we go, where it kind of describes how every particle in the universe, every single thing, actually attracts every other particle. So gravity is an attractive force between any two particles. 
and it acts in a very specific way. It acts along a line that joins those two uh, particles. We can write an equation to describe this because this is physics and we're in love with equations. Force due to gravity is equal to big G, something called the universal gravitational constant, times mass little m times mass big M. So these are two different masses, your two different particles, divided by r squared, where r squared is the line that's joining them, the distance between the two particles. Big G is a constant, the universal gravitational constant. It's equal to 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11 newtons times meters squared over kilograms squared. And if we draw a picture of what this looks like, we can have two masses. So here's mass little m, here's mass big M, and they're going to have a gravitational force that acts between them that's based on their separation. So the distance between these two from center to center is going to be equal to r, and there's going to be a gravitational force that big M experiences due to little m, and little m experiences due to big M. And that force is going to be equal and opposite. So one's going to pull the other, and the other is going to pull the first. And those forces are equal and opposite. Uh, we know this, actually, due to something in a previous chapter uh, called Newton's Third Law. last important thing to know about orbits and kind of circular motion are the laws of this guy named Kepler. So Kepler studied orbital motion and came up with Kepler's three laws of uh, movement of how planets in particular orbit. His first law is that planets orbit in ellipses. So these are kind of like flattened out circles and they have the Sun at one focus. So to understand this, we kind of need to draw an ellipse and understand the anatomy of an ellipse. So anytime I draw an ellipse, kind of a flattened out circle, there's two little focus points that I can draw to actually uh, describe this ellipse. There's the shortest length along the ellipse. We call that the minor axis. And then we have the line that joins the uh, two farthest points of the ellipse, kind of the longer axis of this, we call that the major axis. And then we can describe how flat this ellipse is with something called the eccentricity. So every single planet orbits uh, in this kind of elliptical egg type of shape orbits around uh, the Sun, where the Sun lives at one of these focus points, maybe the Sun lives right here, and then the other focus point is actually an imaginary focus point. There's nothing actually there, it's just kind of empty, but it lets us geometrically describe how planets orbit. Our second law of Kepler is that planets uh, sweep out equal areas in equal amounts of time. There's some good animations online that you can uh, use your Google Foo to actually find that actually shows this very, very clearly for you. So I recommend doing that. And then we also have Kepler's third law, which tells us basically that period squared, so how long a planet takes to orbit its sun, uh, and that has to be given in years, is gonna be proportional to A cubed, where A is the semi-major axis. So that's how far away you are from orbiting the star that you're orbiting. The units of that are gonna be in AUs. Uh, and the semi-major axis is gonna be very closely related to the major axis. The semi-major axis is actually just one half of this major axis. Uh, so those are Kepler's three laws. Uh, and that's everything we should know about gravity and orbits.